you're talking about getting a guy in a position where he can tax the upfield ability of the pass blocker as quickly as he can. And you're also talking about trying to get the guy to compromise his squared up relationship with the line of scrimmage as quickly as you can. Now, if you took a defensive end, like take this right end, for example, uh, in 99% of the pass protections that we see, this tackle blocks this defensive end. And so by his alignment, what he wants to do is make it as difficult as he can on that tackle as quickly as he can. That's why you see defensive ends line up so wide. Uh, that's why you see them get in a position to be able to cause that big guy lined up in that position to be an athlete. And you do that by alignment. And so uh, we, for example, if we had, we're talking to this defensive end about alignment, we say you get out there about a yard and a half wide, you get pointed in uh, some here, and uh, you want this, you want to tax this guy right now. You want him to see right now that he's going to have some trouble blocking you, that you're going to try to make him an athlete as quickly as you possibly can. So that if this guy is really good at what he does, he wants to stay as squared up as he possibly can as he drops back there to pass, protect, and block this guy. Now, what we would like for him to do is to compromise that relationship with the line of scrimmage as quickly as we can. And no matter how good they are, we can get a lot of them, most of them, to do that by our alignment. Now, the thing that's involved there is that same thing we talked about in pass rush, and that's takeoff, that the advantage that that tackle has is he knows when it's going, when the ball's being snapped, but for that pass rusher out there, uh, he knows that in order to nullify that advantage that that pass blocker's got, uh, what he wants to do is he wants to be able to take off as quickly as he can and the first thing that moves will either be that guy's hand he's lined up on or the ball. So the critical factors here are take, try to take something away by your alignment if you can. And that is the ability for the outside rushers to get as much width as they can. And then the big thing about it, and, and I see them every week in our league. I look at them and see them in our league. These guys most of them are not convinced that the straightest, that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. They're not convinced of that. You know why I know that? Because I watch them. They start here, and then they go there. And a lot of them start here, and you will see on, on the end zone camera that they'll fade out here and then try to rush the passer. What the hell? Why would you do that? If, if the guy's back here with the ball, you've got to monitor the detail of that that alignment so that this guy is coming this way so that he knows where this guy is going to be and that he's going to attack that blocker and get with him quickly that way not help him by going up the field and so for the outside rusher alignment angle is crucial to him uh, takeoff is crucial to all pass rushers now with the inside guys whether we got tackles in there whoever's lined up in there the same thing pretty much holds true, that if, and, and there's a couple of factors involved here, one is uh, that if you're going to have a, the ability to be able to beat this guy either side, you're a little better off to be head up on him. But at the same time, if you want to try to beat him inside so you start up the field outside, the fact that you, again, take some kind of an alignment angle on him helps you to compromise his squared up relationship with the line of scrimmage and therefore get him in a position where you start him here and you make the move on him inside. He does not have recovery, recovery ability. That's important in a pass rush. Again, the ability to be able to take those things away from him. Now. Some things have happened with the game itself uh, that dictate 
uh, pass rush being a little different than it used to be. In the old days, when I first started in this, when there were seven step drop and that guy was operating 10 yards behind the line of scrimmage, the outside pass rusher was an effective uh, type of guy who would line up with that width and beat that guy on the corner because what, what I call a junction point or the place where the guy was going to step and throw the ball was available to him uh, by taking that angle. Now the game has evolved to a hell of a lot of three-step and five-step drops so that you can nullify this guy easily because of what's happening here, excuse me, in the passing game at our level. Now, during the time when we had a lot of this seven-step drop and that guy was operating back there, we would say that the job of the outside rushers is to force the quarterback up. The job of the inside rushers is to force the quarterback back. And so as a result, the rush lanes kind of looked like the tines of a fork. And that, that we had that guy in there, and, and uh, we rushed him, and we were effective with him by rushing hard over the corner and then trying to get something done inside with our inside rushers. But these guys were the most crucial guys. The defensive ends were the guys who always led in sacks during that period of time. Uh, now, what we've seen is with the advent of the three and the five step drop, that these guys all of a sudden have become more important. And that there's basically two ways to be effective in the face of the three and the five step pass dropper. And one of them is to have a tall guy who can make the move a guy, or the other one is somebody who can push the pile right back in the lap of the quarterback. We got two of those guys. We got Gil Brown that does that. We got Santana Dotson that does that, a big, tall, athletic guy in there. That changes the mode of what plays defensive tackle in this league. They always used to be short, squatty guys. Now we got a guy who's 6'5" who makes a move and the quarterback's trying to throw three-step drop stuff quick or five-step drop stuff quick, he's an effective guy in that situation. And so now the inside rushers become different. And then all of a sudden, this guy that we created in the 80s, you know, Lawrence Taylor, uh, caused us to create this guy, this guy we call the defensive end or outside linebacker pass rusher who was a fast guy. He wasn't real big, but he was fast. Lawrence was big and fast. But we started to take littler guys and put them in that position, and they were effective, effective until people started to go to this three and five step drop stuff, and then all of a sudden those guys don't exist hardly anymore. We're not playing with them anymore. We're playing with true defensive ends outside, uh, guys who can start the pass rush, and they read the rush, and now I read the pass, and now they're in a position to be able to push that pile back in there and squeeze that pocket and get their hands up. And, and that's crucial with the pass rush. And then these guys here are the guys who are able to either by making the move quickly or by driving them back in there, be effective with a, up in the quarterback's face against the three and the five step drop teams. So uh, those are some things that, uh, about the pass rush that I think are, are really crucial. Now, some things about, uh, aside from the pass rush that, that in addition to, one of the things about the pass rush that I think is really is that people who are rushing the passer understand that you are more effective rushing the passer three yards away from the passer uh, with your hands up in his sight line than you are a foot away from him but out of his sight line. You, you, you don't affect him. Uh, when the quarterback is looking to throw the ball here and you're rushing here, you have no effect on him. You might get a hit on him, but you have no effect on him. The guy who has effect on him is the guy who's in front of him, in his sight line, with his hands up. And now, uh, you know, this is one place in football where being close counts. Uh, hands up, high trajectory of the ball. Forces him to throw it, loft it higher, give defensive backs more time to react to the thrown ball. Uh, he, he may have a guy wide open, but he can't see him because the hands are up. A, a ball deflected is a ball we don't have to defend down the field. So there are a lot of reasons why 
It's crucially important that these guys learn to when a quarterback raises the ball to work in front of them and get the hands up. Get the hands up. And again, the discipline that comes from uh, the ability to be able to get the hands up and not jump, keep your feet on the ground is important too. And that has to do with, you know, uh, what you do drill-wise and otherwise, and we'll talk a little about that tomorrow. But that's, that's very important, those factors about the hands. And again, uh, those are the things that uh, I, I think determine to a large degree how effective the modern-day passing game is. Now, with games and stunts, we call them me and you stunts that involve basically these two guys. Just a little thing about that. Uh, you know, uh, if, if we're running a me stunt, our tackle calls it, and the tackle goes first. It's a you stunt that the end goes first. Now, when do you run them? Uh, what's the most effective way to run them? Uh, just a couple of things. I think uh, I, I like to determine it by, by what I call separation and pass set. If we're talking about the drop back game and we get a tackle who is a relatively soft setter and a guard who is a firm setter, there isn't any question about how I would like to rush the passer if I were going to use a game or stunt. One in this situation was the end would always go first in that situation uh, because we got the natural separation to either pick in here or else to break what we call break the pocket or be able to become the inside rusher on that side because that's what games and stunts do. With this guy here now we have a chance to pick the guy blocking him if they're blocking a man or if they're zoning it off if they're zoning it off then to be able to him hook him with his outside arm as he goes and then come back around. Either way uh, we have the possibility of beating him with the stunt because of the separation between the two guys. Now, uh, a me stunt, I don't like it. If they're separating like this, you're wasting your time. He starts to move, he stabs him here, and then there's no timing on the stunt. You can't have it. Now, however, if these two guys are setting at relatively the same distance, which a lot of five-step guys do, now we got this, a lot of the same things going, the possibility of picking the tackle here or of snatching this guy with our inside arm and try, trying to bring him back around uh, free. He has a chance to break the pocket in there if they're separate. They, we'll never get the tackle as a firmer setter than this guy, but if they're relatively close, then we would rather send the tackle first and then bring the end around. Try to apply that logic. And it pretty much holds up with what we try to do uh, in, in terms of, of when we run the game either way. Now, if we're going to run those games against the running game, first, first thing that we do is say, okay, they got to be a quick game, no flash. In other words, he goes, he gives himself a little space, and he goes around. If you're the second guy in the stunt, if, if you're the number two guy, you're the first guy, first guy goes quick, second guy, we say flash that guy, start up the field on him, and then come. If we're running him in running situation, he goes first, he gives himself a little space off the ball, and they run him quick. So we say this, if you're running him in a run situation to kind of disrupt the running lanes and the rushing lanes and the blocking scheme, then you do them fast. If you do them against the passing game, then the first guy goes first, the second guy threatens or flashes the guy he's lined up over, and then he rubs it tight. So uh, that's what we like to do there. Now, once in a while, we'll run a twist on the inside with these two guys, and when we do that, what we're usually doing is we're usually blitzing off the outside, and we're trying to use up three guys with our two because of the game. Very few offensive line coaches are going to leave uh, are going to bring the center out of there when he reads the game. They're going to try to block the game and push it off and block these two with these three. And so when we're, when we got games and stunts going uh, inside here, it's usually because we're trying to, we would like to blitz somebody off the corner. And, uh, I, and that's pretty important. Now, uh, if we are involved in a process of running our uh, three-man games in here, now that's a little bit different situation for us and, and with the three-man line the only game that's any good at all is to bring him first and bring him around. There are too many bad things that can happen if he gets pinned and then you try to bring him around. Here we can distort the scheme, we can collapse this in here so that the nose has a chance to make a play over the top if they do elect to run it or do something. But to bring the nose first is, is I think putting yourself in too much jeopardy there in terms of uh, the, the running game and what can happen 
time uh, on the outside there, okay? All right, so uh, that's a little bit about games and stunts and movement on armies and some of the things that we try to do. Now, here, the thing about nickel and dime defenses is why basically what we're doing is we're reacting to, to personnel that the offense puts on the field. We're looking for better matchups, and, and that's why we go to our nickel and our dime defenses. Now, uh, uh, basically what we say is if they give us three wides, uh, we put our nickel on the field, five defensive backs, they give us four wides, we put six defensive backs on the field, and, and some people like Pittsburgh now uh, are running five wides, and when they do, uh, you know, we go with a, what we call our quarter defense or seven defensive backs on the field. Now, uh, the fronts, uh, we play basically uh, two fronts, we've been playing them for a long time, I've been using these ever since my days at the Rams, we play a 40 and a 33 front. Now, we 40, we got four down rushers in there. Uh, we've got two guys in the linebacker positions. And then uh, uh, we got uh, five defensive backs in there. Uh, now, if we're playing our dime defense, we got four down guys. We got one linebacker. And then we got six defensive backs in the ball game. Now, we change that front up a little bit. And we'll play what we call our, our nickel or dime 33 front. And all we do is we take one of the tackles out of the game and then uh, bring an extra linebacker in the game for him. Now, with that look, uh, that allows us to be able to do uh, some things, and we'll talk about those, but not the least of which is to rush three guys and put eight guys in coverage some way. It might not necessarily be all of them dropping back, but it gives you the possibility to be able to double any of the receivers, uh, double any of the backs, uh, spy on a quarterback, do all of those kinds of things with them. So that's where the value of that particular defense lies. Uh, and, and again, there's some real value. Uh, I, I think one of the things that's happened, and, and we were the first team, I guess, to do this very much, is back in 85, when I was with the Rams, when the San Francisco 49ers were so good with Montana and Rice and Taylor and and all of the guys they had, Roger Craig, uh, or Russ Francis was their tight end. They were a very, very good team. They were an excellent football team, and we couldn't match up with them. Uh, they passed the ball a lot better than they ran it, uh, and they were very good at what they did in terms of establishing an offensive rhythm, then you couldn't get them off the field. So our whole deal was to try to play uh, nickel defenses on first down against their regular personnel on the field. Now, uh, with that in mind, uh, you gotta make sure you understand all the hazards of doing that. That you gotta make sure that, first of all, you can handle the running game, uh, that you're able to find ways to be able to uh, uh, come up with run forces that are sound, when maybe you don't have enough guys at the perimeter to be able to do that. Uh, it forced us to come up with new ways and new terms in terms of, uh, uh, you know, we had uh, 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 cloud force or uh, corner force. We had sky force on the outsider safety force. We had backer force. Now we had to come up with a term called sky man, where if they blocked our defensive end down, then our, uh, even though we were playing a man-for-man -man coverage, our nickelback had to become the force guy. So there, there were a lot of things that happened there, but uh, what's happening a little more now in our league is that people are, are playing a little more nickel defense against regular people on the field. Now, uh, some of the philosophy of that, uh, uh, and, and I think you can see uh, where the hazards might be, but if you lined up here against regular people, and this is the nickel back on the strong side, the formation, if this is a strong side and that's a back out there, but if that's a wide receiver sitting out there, and a nickel's lined up over there, and now uh, you, this, uh, the run force on that side of the formation becomes a problem. Uh, you don't have the extra guy there, uh, but you've got to be able to come up a way, with a way to be able to handle that. Now, let's start with, with uh, a base defense, just to kind of get into the... Uh, what the nickel defense consists of, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, this is a normal alignment uh, of, of people. Uh, this is uh, uh, the outside backer here. He becomes the key now for us. Uh, 
The thing that is important when you're playing the nickel defense is to have as much carryover as you can in the defense in the scheme. For example, if you're a 4-3 defensive team, you'd like to think that these four guys are the same guys and they do a lot of the same things. You'd like to think that this guy is the same guy as the middle linebacker and does a lot of the same things. You'd like to think that if you were playing a four deep, a two deep defense, for example, that these guys would all be doing the same thing. So now, to make sense out of a, of constructing then a, a nickel defense, you only got one guy that's different. That's this guy here. Put your nickel back in for him, and you got a nickel defense. Now, all you're saying really is that you are matching up better from a personnel standpoint and a coverage standpoint with this guy on this time than you are with this guy. Now, that's a lot of what happened to us in, in, in a Super Bowl game. Uh, New England was moving the ball on us some. Uh, they were throwing the ball pretty effectively against us in the first quarter there. And, and really, I didn't like some of the matchups that, that we were in in that game. Two things happened. One is it was pretty clear they couldn't run the ball on us. And then the second thing was that if we put the nickel on a field, that, that we could match up better with them. And that's what we did, and, and it worked out real well for us. But you gotta, you got to be able to think in terms of when you put the nickel on a field, getting your best possible matchups. And the, best, and, and the, first, the place that it starts for you is right here, this matchup on this guy. The nickel on the strong number two receiver, whoever this is. In this case, it's the tight end. And so uh, th th that's part of the deal there. Now, again, if you're going to play nickel against regular defensive uh, uh, offensive personnel, then you've got to solve this problem over here of this guy being the same kind of player this buck linebacker is on the line of scrimmage up the field hard. And there's a couple of ways that you do that. One is we play this guy wider so that we get the great key and work him up the field hard here so that if any kind of a down block, we get a reaction from him as a replacement, as a sky force player on that side of the defense. That's one. Uh, and, and, and that's something we got to pay attention to the detail of. Now, the other offensive sets that we see that we got to be able to match up against with our nickel is, first of all, three wides and two backs. And this is the way that it looks, and we like that matchup real well. These are two linebackers. This is our nickel defense on the field. They got two backs in there. We're comfortable with all of those types of alignments. Now, the other group that we get, and we get this a lot on first down, and this is what Detroit that ran a lot with Barry Sanders in there knowing what they had. If you go to a matchup principle like we talked about where the nickel lines up on the strong back and they put three wide receivers, this is a receiver, receiver, receiver in the game. Okay? Now, that means that over on the passing side of the formation, you got, you're matched up pretty good. You got the wide receiver, you got a wide receiver on the back side, you got the corner on a wide receiver and you're in great shape. If you've got a dime on a field, you're, you're matched up good with a, a, a back on a tight end, and you like all of that. The thing that you don't like about that is run force over here on this side, the formation. You've got to do something about that there. You've got to be able to have a way on that side of the formation where you can come up with a way to play run force on that side. For example, they block down. They get the, if they can get to the reach there and bring him back around, they got a chance to have a pretty good play there on that side of the formation. So you got to find a way to be able to handle that. Now, we, we move our tight end, I mean our defensive end around a lot. Uh, we will play out there in a nine sum, and that helps us in that situation. He becomes an inside filler. He's a scraper there, and that helps us. Uh, but that's a problem. Now, uh, I'm going to show you another problem uh, area that, that you need to handle the detail of uh, in that situation. Say they line up in a, in a trips formation. And now 
Uh, you make your normal adjustment. He's on number two to the strong side again. And I'd line up and play. It doesn't matter what coverage is. You feel a little better about it now. You got him available. You still got people there. Now, where a problem area is developing for you now is if you took your normal uh, run controls, you got him here, you got him here, he's here, he's here, he's here. Here's where you got a problem, potential on the backside, the formation, on the run. Now, there's lots of ways to be able to handle that, but one of the ways that we uh, think you can handle that uh, are two ways, basically. One is to be able to have your backside safety responsible for that gap on any runs away because of the coverage design like quarter, 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 quarter. One way. And the other way to be able to play that backside gap is to take this guy here now and just make a simple call with him on the backside to formation where you will bring him inside here, bring him to a two gap here, and inside with run away, and then give him the backside outside gap. But you gotta account for the detail of that in the run. And, and, and again, it's just a matter of, of recognizing uh, where those problems are because you're lined up and playing a nickel or a dime defense against a team that has run potential because there's a tight end in the game. That's the key. If there's a tight end in the game, you gotta account for it. Now, and the only thing, only place you got a problem is if your nickelback, your extra guy, your buck linebacker is not on the tight end side, then you got a problem you got to solve. And then if your nickel's on the tight end side, then you got a B-gap problem on the back side. That's very simple to be able to define. But you got to be able to cover that. And uh, again, uh, uh, these are the kinds of things that you pay attention to the detail of. Uh, uh, when you commit to running nickel defenses. Now, we, we, we also have to be able to play our nickel defenses against four wides. And uh, obviously, uh, there are some things that people are doing now from the standpoint of the running game uh, with nickel defenses because uh, and, and we'll talk a little about this tomorrow, about horizontal and vertical structures with zone coverages and how people by alignments force you to defend a whole field right now. Uh, but one of the things that happens is they, because of the four wides look here, would like to get you spread out all over the field uh, and then uh, take your guy who is normally a linebacker in the box, take him out there in coverage, and then end up with a hat for a hat and then hand the ball to Barry Sanders. Uh, now, if you do that, if you do that, then you have retained, by moving him out, the ability to maintain the integrity of your four deep coverage. They don't know by your alignment where you, what you're playing. They got no idea what you're playing. You can play every coverage you got with those guys there. Now, but, you have compromised the box. You only got five guys in the box. Now, the thing is, if they give you that look, and you want to keep this guy in the box, then you kick him over here, you keep your back, backer in here, you like the numbers game against the run because now you've got six on their five, and you're in great shape. Only, you know what the problem is? Only problem you got now is because you've done that and you've moved them committed to some kind of a three deep or man for man safety free that's all you can play you don't have anything else in there so now whenever again it's a matter of always give and take now you get six in the box you're great against the run and now pass they understand what they got they got a matchup if they want it uh, anywhere along the line there, man for man coverage wise, or they're co you're committed to three deep zone, they straighten up and they throw the quick stuff at you all day long. Now, the trick, the ability to be able to, uh, what I say, be involved in, in good disguise from a coverage standpoint, show them three deep, end up 
in four across four deep. Uh, show them four deep and uh, end up in a situation uh, where you show them four, end up in three. Some combination on the snap of the football to be able to show them one thing, play another thing. And that's part of the key in, in this business today is to be able to change up that way and, and, and uh, you've only got so many guys and so many places to put them in. Knowing that time is always on your side so that the less time that quarterback's got or that offensive team has got to ascertain what they got in the way of coverage, in the way of people in the box, the shortest amount of time that they got puts you in the best defensive position. Uh, and I don't think that changes any. Now, a couple of things here about uh, that gap control thing we talked about. Uh, against a two-back set, if you're going to play uh, uh, nickel defenses, and they start flow to the strong side of the formation, when you got the backside B-gap problem, if you move him on the top of the football to a two-gap situation, then you've got the availability of this guy on the backside of the formation against two backs. That puts you in good position that way. Now, and the thing that we just talked about was the ability to be able to take these front guys and be able to get on a three-step or the five-step drop enough pass rush there to be able to be effective up in his face and to be able to squeeze the lanes here uh, at the angle. Uh, again, when you take this guy out of the game and put a Mike linebacker in, and you line up with your people who are involved here, you got the linebacker here and you got another linebacker in the game. If you take and put him in a rush position, which is all you do, then you play all of the same coverages. Now you're still the same four deep look, these are still the same two backers that these two guys are, and you've merely replaced this guy with this guy, and you run a game or a stunt, or bring him out here, and run a game or a stunt with him, and you're running the same coverages with a two linebacker defense with your nickel back in there, and with five backs in the ball game. So that's the whole theory of the 33 defense. The key to the 33 defense, in terms of alignments, is that they always have to be able to count these guys in the box. So they got to be on a stagger on the inside leg of that defensive end always so they got one, two, three, four, five, six guys in the box. You can't change that any. If you want them to be effective in terms of the running game that you would look at uh, against the 33 defense. Now, uh, gap control wise, uh, you can end up in decent shape. If Flo shows to this side the formation, he's a C-gap player, he's a D-gap player, he's a B-gap player, uh, he's a backside or frontside A-gap player, he's a frontside A-gap player, he's a B-gap player, and he's up the field, so you're in pretty good shape. You got enough people to play all the gaps. And the big thing is that the Mike linebacker is a downhill player on the front side of the formation all the time. Now, uh, again, uh, one of the advantages of, of the 33 defense, like we talked about, is, is that you can take the extra linebacker and do a lot of different things with him. For example, 33 defense, and we, we, you just, we just showed you five in a box there. Same thing, move one of the backers out in coverage, you maintain the integrity of your four deep. If you keep all three of them in there, now you take a safety and put them up, now you're in the same situation you were in with the 40 defense. Uh, they're nothing for nothing in football. And, and you only got so many guys to put in so many places. And to me, the key is uh, the ability to be able to think through those situations. Uh, and, and whenever you place guys in a spot, you got to automatically think of what that does for the offense, what offensive advantage there is, and what you gain by putting it in there defensively. And you weigh the two. And then in the balance is always the personnel you're playing and how your guys match up against their guys. And if you can put all of those things in a hopper, then you come up with what you play and how you play it and how you use your guys and whether or not, if, you got a, if they got a shitty running back, you don't care about it. You play five big guys in a box all day long. If that guy back there is not a threat, that guy's a hell of a threat. If that's Barry Sanders back there, you better pay attention to the detail of it because every time he touches it, it can be a home run. Now, that's a no-brainer. 
how you do that one now. But, I mean, there's a lots, of, lots of gray area in between there that you've got to be able to handle the detail of, okay? Okay, now, one of the things that's, that's happening in our business, well, let's, let's go back here again. Most of everything that we see, in other words, that will allow us to play every coverage we have is to rush forward, defend with what we got left, seven. Run out all of our coverages, anything we want, any kind of man, any kind of zone, two deep, uh, uh, four across, uh, quarter, 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 anything we want to play. Now, what's happening in our league some is that we used to always say, okay, if we want to bring an additional guy, we rush five, play man-free coverage, so we got the one guy as a free safety, then we got five guys on their five wide receivers, and we're, I mean, five eligible receivers, and we're rushing five guys. Now we're getting a lot of what we call fire zones, uh, uh, or uh, uh, zone blitzes. And uh, this is an example of one of those. We run some of them, uh, not as many as like Carolina. Carolina has been very effective with that scheme. They were very effective with that scheme, uh, as has uh, Pittsburgh been. But basically, what what's happening there is that people are saying that they're going to adopt the same philosophy with their uh, uh, nickel defense that they have in their base defense, and that they're going to commit linebackers or, or safeties or secondary people to the rush, and then in place of that guy, they're going to put an unusual guy. They're going to drop a backer where a safety usually covers, or they're going to drop a defensive lineman where a linebacker usually covers. And uh, we do a little of that. Uh, you know, I, I did a little bit of it, uh, uh, and, and we got lucky. Uh, I dropped Gil Brown, now 300 pounds, uh, and they wanted to put me in an insane asylum. Guys said after the game, we see you dropping Gil Brown in the game, and I said, yes. And they said, how are you? Have you lost your mind? And, but we got lucky. I said, how did they hurt us? They didn't. We got lucky. They threw a check down one time. Gil got about a three-yard drop uh, and, and made the tackle for a one yard. Another time, he wandered around, had no idea what he was doing. They threw a little swing pass out the outside, back tripped a little. He tackled him, no gain, two plates. And all of a sudden, uh, it, it, it became... Uh, not a bad strategic move. Uh, plus, uh, they said, who do you expect him to cover? I said, nobody. But I said, I do know this, that if he's in a zone, it's a long ways around him. So th that's how we tried to cover up for uh, the fact that we were dropping Gil Brown in there. But basically what it involves is, is, is trying to maintain balance in a rush lane. So if, if the nickel's going to come on a, on a nickel blitz, for example, or fire zone, then the end makes the inside move. He becomes the inside rusher. He's the outside rusher. Uh, he's the inside rusher. Uh, that end is the outside rusher. And now this tackle will go in there just like he's going to two-gap in there and run. And then he reads past. Now he becomes the hook defender on that side to formation. Very simple. And, and, you know, everybody would think that the primary thing would be to get this guy back and, and, and that drop and distance was the factor. And it's not. It, it goes back to that same principle we talked about. That guy goes up in there, and, and he two gaps. Now he reads pass. Now he, we want him to just drop straight back uh, into the hook zone. But, but again, don't compromise that princip those principles of staying square line scrambling. See what's going to happen. Quarterback might, might be involved in a scramble, might have handed the ball off in a draw, or something like that. So see what, what's happening, as opposed to turning and trying to run out of there. You know, so, so you don't fool yourself with that. And, and, and again, I think you get something out of it. There's a lot of examples of it. Now, if you were to talk about uh, fire zones, there are lots of different ways to do it. Uh, here we are uh, in, in a situation here where we're bringing the outside, the backer now with the defensive end, and now the tackle's dropping out of there. Then there are times when you bring five, bring a safety, a backer, and these uh, uh, four guy, one, two, three, four, outside guy here and drop here and play a three under zone. Now, People who do this a lot play three under zone some. But, you know, that's, that's, that's getting a little hairy. And, and uh, I don't really believe in that a lot because, again, I'd like to 
I'd like to be able to fix responsibility when somebody throws a short into a short zone, and if you don't have anybody to play it, and you're trying to play three under instead of four under, then I think you're asking for some trouble. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, one of the things that, that we see uh, again in terms of the nickel defense is, is is the ability to be able to bring any combination of five guys. One, your four down guys, and then a, a, a safety, a nickel back, a backer in there, a safety from either side, a corner in there, and, and all of us do all of those things with our defense. It's, it's got to all be part of it. Uh, as I said many times, we've taken a reasonably simple game and screwed it up to the point where uh, we now no longer have any off-season shit. It cuts into your fishing and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, uh, but that's because we think we got to be and our players got to be nuclear or rocket scientists to play or coach this game, and, and that's another way we fool ourselves. Uh, now, uh, I, I, again, if we were to take a uh, 33, and I just want to put this up, and, and this is where the guys who are in 34 defenses and play a lot of 33 are better off in the fire zones because now they have uh, all kinds of people that they can bring, one, two, three, four, five underneath people anytime, or all the safeties and so, that, so on. But what they got when they do that is if they were to play a four under zone here, they got a corner, they got a, a, a um, a Mike linebacker now instead of a tackle that they're dropping out of there and so they can maintain the integrity of the zones a lot better because they got a guy who's really trained to do that. Okay? Okay, we don't want to make this into a marathon all night so I, I guess uh, Bob we're going to just get everybody in here and just uh, have a little deal here and uh, kind of talk about uh, anybody got any questions about anything, huh? Is that what we're doing?